This is Cashflow Ninja, episode 51 with Harry Dent. Welcome to the Cashflow Ninja, the podcast empowering and inspiring people to discover how to generate their own income and manage, grow, and protect their own wealth in the new economy. Now, here is your host, MC Laubscher. Hello everyone, welcome to the Cashflow Ninja. I'm your host, MC Lobsher, and thank you so much for spending some time with me today. I have a very interesting show for you today, and as you guys are well aware as listeners of the show, I try to expose my listeners to many viewpoints and as much information possible, and then encourage you to do your own research and form your own opinion. My goal is to empower and help educate you with the guests I have on and the information I share not to tell you what to believe and how to think. My guest today will definitely challenge your thinking and force you to look at things in a different way. He is no stranger to controversy, and I think you're going to find this interview extremely interesting. I'm honored to have on the show today Harry Dent. Harry Dent studied economics in college in the 1970s, receiving his MBA from the Harvard Business School, where he was a Baker Scholar, and he was elected to the Century Club for Leadership Excellence. Harry grew to find the study of economics vague and inconclusive and became so disillusioned by the state of his chosen profession that he turned his back on it. Instead, he threw himself into the burgeoning new science of finance which married economic research and market research, identifying and studying demographic trends, business cycles, consumers' purchasing power, and many other trends empowered Harry to forecast economic and market changes. The core of his work, The Dent Method, which includes forecasting long-term economic trends based on the study of and changes in demographic trends, was developed by Harry in the late 1980s. Since then, he has spoken to executives, financial advisors, and investors around the world. He's appeared on Good Morning America, PBS, CNBC, CNN, and Fox News. He's been featured in Barron's Investors Business Daily, Entrepreneur, Fortune, Success, U.S. News and World Report, Business Week, The Wall Street Journal, American Demographics, and Omni. He's a regular guest on the Fox Business show, America's Nightly Scorecard. A best-selling author, Harry's written numerous successful books over the years, including The Demographic Cliff, How to Survive and Prosper During the Great Deflation of 2014 to 2019, which details why we're facing a great deflation after five years of stimulus and what to do about it now. Most recently, Harry published The Sale of a Lifetime, How the Great Bubble Burst of 2017 Can Make You Rich, outlining the upcoming economic crisis and revealing how it could be the single greatest wealth-building opportunity we'll ever see, and how to capitalize from this unique and historical opportunity. Now, many financial experts and economists agree with Harry Dent that we are in an unprecedented debt and financial bubble with central banks quantitative easing and money printing, but just adding kerosene to the fire. And they all agree that it is impossible for things to keep going on like this forever, Without a bad ending, they do all ever disagree on the outcome of this bubble burst. They see the dollar collapsing and gold going to 5000 plus. Harry Dent sees the dollar strengthening and gold going to as low as $250 an ounce. It's the deflation versus inflation debate. Now, inflation is when there's an increase in the money supply of a country, and this increase in money flows into assets like real estate and stock markets, to create bubbles. Inflation works out great for the rich because of the asset inflation. The rich people already have assets like real estate and stocks, and they see the values of these assets increase significantly, while the poor see the price inflation on the street in the rise of prices of things needed for survival, like their shelter, their rent, right, and food and clothing. Now, when these bubbles burst because of the central bank policies, 
Harry Dent sees the asset prices of, of all the assets falling, including gold. The money will rush towards the U.S. dollar because people still regard the U.S. dollar as a safe haven and not gold. The experts that have the inflation outcome argument believes in the response to the bubbles bursting, the central banks will increase the money supply even more to reflate the bubble through quantitative easing and money printing, resulting in more inflation and money rushing into gold as a safe haven because of its store of value benefits. I hope you enjoyed today's interview. Let me know your thoughts on Twitter. I'm at, at MC Lobsher or by email info at cashflowninja.com. And please remember to join our mailing list by signing up at cashflowninja.com or texting Cashflow Ninja, one word, all capitalized, to 44222. That's two fours and three twos. Now, as some of my listeners may know, I live in Newtown, Pennsylvania, a town that's about 45 minutes away from Philadelphia, the birthplace of the United States, the home of the cheesesteak, the Rocky Steps, and also the hometown of the beloved founding father, Benjamin Franklin. Benjamin Franklin believed an investment in knowledge pays the best interest, and early to bed and early to rise makes a man healthy, wealthy, and wise. The Cashflow Ninja have aligned itself with partners that aims to empower you to be healthy, wealthy, and wise. Our healthy partner, Onnit, provides supplements, nutrient-dense and earth-grown foods, and fitness equipment to achieve your next level of well-being and total human optimization. Our listeners can get a 10% discount with coupon code GETONIT at CashflowNinjaHealth.com. That coupon code, again, is GETONIT. Our wealthy partner, Fundrise, gives everyone the opportunity to invest directly in high-quality real estate without the middlemen. Fundrise makes the process of investing in the highest quality commercial real estate from around the country simple, efficient, and transparent. You can get started with as little as $1,000 and don't have to be an accredited investor to participate in some of their offerings. You can check them out at CashflowNinjaWealth.com. Our wise partner, Audible, offers a free download of any audiobook. When you try Audible for 30 days, you can download your free audiobook at CashflowNinjaBook.com. Hey, this is John Lee Dumas from Entrepreneur on Fire, and you're listening to the Cashflow Ninja Podcast with your host, MC Lobsher. You must be prepared to ignite. Mr. Dent, welcome to the show. Nice to be here. Can you please share a little bit about your background and your journey as an economist and selling author as, as well as a business owner and investor? Well, you know, I didn't set out to be an economist. I, I did start as an economics major at college, took three courses and felt like I was wasting my time. Nobody can understand economists. They disagree looking at the same facts. And they go out of the way to say nobody can predict the future past the next election. I'm like, well, why do I need you guys? And so I, may, I, I went into you know, business strategy and, and worked for a Fortune 100 company for two years and then Bain & Company consulting business strategy for Fortune 100 companies. And I just got bored with large companies. They're just slow to change. So I started doing the same thing with new ventures. And that's where I discovered demographics. Because in the early 80s, I was consulting to small companies that were growing very rapidly in California. But they were growing because they were appealing to the new young baby boomers who were starting new trends and new S-curve progressions and products and changing the world as they entered the workforce. And, and, and young people drive innovation. And so I started looking at the baby boy, and I'm like, oh, my gosh, most people don't understand how big this generation is, how, how demographics now give us data on what people do from cradle to grave so we can see how this baby boom is going to cause one industry after the next to bubble and boom as they age. So I really got into demographics. I was always a cycle guy. I, I just found that demographics was a uniquely projectable cycle. A lot of cycles are just, hey, commodities peak about every 29 to 30 years. Well, they still do, and, and they probably will for a long time. But this is something I can project in any country around the world or even in, in local markets and stuff or in specific products. And so I kind of like, oh, my God, I stumbled on the ultimate cycle. And I'm not just going on some time cycle. I can actually project when people will eat the most potato chips, when they'll be into weight loss and weigh the most, when they'll buy, spend the most money in houses, when they'll um, 
spend the most money on cars, anything, you know, nursing homes, you name it, breakfast cereals. Um, and when they spend the most, when they save the most, uh, all the things that drive our economy, when they're the most productive. I mean, young people cause inflation because they're extremely unproductive uh, productive and expensive until they enter the workforce. And even when they enter the workforce, it takes two and a half years for them to start to earn, uh, create more um, growth and profit for their company than it costs to train them and incorporate them. So I found like demographics was like the holy grail. And since then, I mean, and, and when I found this and really got together some key indicators in the late 80s, I, I decided well, it's time to start writing books, and I became an economist, not by choice. I've just like my own research in business and experience in business and real life with real consumers and real businesses. And, and again, my biggest criticism of economists is simple, like that most of them look like they never had sex or run a business. So what the hell do they know about anything? You know? Now, in your book, The Demographic Cliff, you had discussed the biggest trend in our lifetime, the baby boomer trend. Can you speak to the impact that this baby boomer trend will have on the stock and housing markets and what opportunities you have identified and what industries stand to profit most? Yeah, I mean, what we did in the demographic cliff was like, you know, follow our previous books on demographics and take a more global view and say, look, one country after the next. It started with Japan in, in the early 90s. We predicted Japan's collapse while at the same time predicting U.S., Europe and the rest of the world would see the greatest boom industry in the 90s. That was all demographics. Japan was peaking ahead of the rest of the countries. And, and then we were kind of the next major country. We predicted back all the way back then that the U.S. would peak in baby boom spending in 2007 and the trends would slow down. And, of course, with, with record debt, that would cause a crisis. And it, and it did. But we said, hey, Europe was next, you know, three to four years after that. And then other countries, South Korea. So we look around the world and say, look, this is a succession of countries going off this demographic cliff, and, and governments and central banks are trying to fight this with free money, covering it over. Oh, we're just in a temporary crisis, and if we can just get through it, we'll go and grow at 3 to 4% a year. We said it's not going to happen. Heavy debt loads, declining demographics now. In every major developed country, except for Korea, in a few years from now, they're going to join the pack, and including China, the only the largest emerging country who has slowing workforce and demographic trends um, since 2012, that we're not going to be able to fight this um, with, with just free money, and we're going to go in the next crisis. Well, in the sill of a lifetime, which just literally came out two weeks ago, right. you know, I finally read another book, and that, that book I focus on bubbles. I already made the demographic argument. I repeat it in this book and in other cycles, but I say, look, the key thing now is people don't get a lot of people think, yeah, the stock market can't go much higher. Blah, blah, yeah, maybe we're due for crisis. I'm like, no, we're due for a crash like 1929 to 32. Bubbles don't correct. They don't go down in soft landings or in staircases. They crash and burn because they go exponential like an orgasm. When orgasm's over, what happens? It's over quickly. Men die and you don't gut for a while, you know, sort of thing. And so we, we just wanted to make the point everybody's going on the financial media and saying, you know, that the, you know, the Federal Reserve and Janet Yellen, chief economists and analysts and politicians and Warren Buffett saying, oh, this isn't a bubble because blah, 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 blah. No, this looks like the bubble, quacks like a bubble, walks like a bubble. It's a bubble. And I've got some bubble charts in this book that if you don't are not convinced, we're in a bubble in real estate, stocks. And now I've got proof better than ever. We've been saying Everything's going to crash in this bubble. Commodities, stocks, real estate. It started in 2008 and 9, but commodities are already down 70% on average globally. And steel, iron ore, and things like that are down 80% already, which just proves my point that they don't correct. You don't have even a major long-term slow crash like in the 1970s. These bubbles burst violently, so you've got to get out of the way. And, and, and you're better to get out a few months early than a few months late because we also show in the book that every major bubble, whether it be 1929 stock bubble and crash or the Nikkei in 1989 to 90 crash or the tech wreck in 2000 or 2008 and 9, that, the, that, that the, crash, the first crash, just the beginning, will see half of the total downturn and crash in the first two and a half to three months. And China just saw the same thing in, in, in mid to late 2015. 
China's Shanghai, this was its second bubble. This is our third bubble, by the way, in the United States, which is very ominous. That bubble crashed 45% in the first three months. It's ultimately going to be down 80 to 90, but it's the same rule. The tech wreck was down 40% in the first two and a half months. It was eventually down almost 80%. Half of the crash is going to happen right off the bat. So do you want to really hold out for the last couple percent of the market? When a bubble like this is just struggling to edge up against bad news, like Deutsche Bank is damn near bankrupt, right. Italy is totally bankrupt, and the markets are still trying to go up, are they nuts? <laughs> yeah. I call I call it the markets on crack. When when you got free money and money flowing into markets because interest rates are zero and there's no way to get a decent return, and the best thing is to do is to buy a blue chip stock with a three percent dividend. Uh, markets want to go up. And they'll, and they'll give every excuse to go up. But when this goes down, even the most blue chip stocks and Facebook and Amazon and Netflix and Apple, they're going to be crucified just like the best blue chip stocks like General Motors were in the early 1930s. Even the companies that survived that shakeout and became the leaders of the world afterward, their stocks went down more than the stock market. Now, you're one of the, the, the few people out there that, that saw this happening to gold. There's a lot of people talking about gold going sky high. And just coming back to the bubble, uh, what do you think are some of the reasons that people do not see these bubbles? I mean, even some of the comments that, that Warren Buffett made. What do you, why do you think they're not seeing this? You know, it, it, very simple answer to that question. Bubbles are high. You're getting something for nothing. You're sitting in your house and it's going up 10 to 20, 10%, 15% a year instead of the normal inflationary 3%. Real estate long term goes with inflation, period. Gold goes up with inflation, period. Stocks normally go up 7% adjusted for inflation, but in a bubble, they're going up 20, sometimes 30, 40%. I was in Dubai when real estate was going up 40% a year. And I'm coming from Miami where it's going up 20%. And I'm thinking this is the biggest bubble I've seen since California. And in Dubai, it's going up 40%. So people don't want that to end. It's a free lunch. But, you know, I kind of learned somewhere along the way, probably when I was born, because um, that was never easy, that you don't get something for nothing in life. And you don't. But people want something for nothing. And I tell you, I've worked with some of the best marketing firms. You know what people buy? Something for nothing. Easy, three-step process, no pain, money-back guarantee, and blah, 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 no risk, no pain, all gain. That's what people buy. If you don't give them that, they don't buy. People want something for nothing. So when a bubble comes along, nobody wants to argue with it. Right. Nobody wants to see it. They are totally obvious. Right. They remove, they remove the punch bowl from the party. Uh, and again, I, I, I have an indicator in the book. And really, I, I, I had this back 20 years ago in presentations, and I forgot about it. I used to show the 1920s, the Roaring Twenties bubble, compared to the Masters and Johnson's orgasm chart, which was scientifically plotted in the late 50s, early 60s. They're the same. And now in this book, I show, look, here's my new bubble test. Hey, the 50s and 60s boom, it was a nice boom, but it wasn't a bubble. The worst crashes were 20%. And it went down and went down in staircase and staircase and staircase. It didn't crash and burn that much. All these bubbles now show, no, bubble, bubble. You know, Sydney real estate, London real estate, Manhattan real estate, you know, text, the NASDAQ bubble, the Nikkei bubble, the now the S&P, the, the third bubble. All these things fit this orgasm chart perfectly. That's their financial orgasm. And when people say, why can't the Fed just keep us going forever? I'm like, well, how long can you keep an orgasm going? That's my answer. <laughs> <laughs> so so true. Now, for the listeners out there that's listening to this and saying, well, we're in a bubble. Well, how, how bad is it going to get? What is it going to look like? You've thrown out a couple of numbers that you see the Dow going. Um, so what what does the markets look like? What do you see the correction in real estate? And, and what do you see for commodities, gold, silver, and oil? Okay, first thing, and, and I'm, I'm going to update the, the new book pretty soon for a chapter I developed just after it came out. i got a model for Bob. The, the thing that just makes me more mad than anything is that when you get a big crash like 2008 or 1930s or 74, 75, people will go like, oh, that was a black swan event. It's one of these one out of a million that only happen every 30 or 80 or 100 years and nobody can predict them. I'm like, this is insanity. Bubbles build predictably. They start going up exponentially versus fundamental more linear trends. And they do that until it gets so expensive that even 
you know, the richest person can't afford a condo in Manhattan. It's, I mean, bubbles defeat themselves by their own exponential growth. It doesn't even take something going wrong. The real estate started declining in the United States in 2006. And we predicted this in late 2005. Without the economy going down, without the stock market crashing, they started to go down because prices got too high and got unaffordable. Now, try to buy a condo in Manhattan today or rent a condo. So they defeat themselves, but they also crashed. Stocks will crash in half the time on average that they build. They build exponentially, so they're extreme. The crash is even more extreme in half the time, and those bubbles will tend to go back to where the bubble started to diverge from the fundamental trends. So I can measure the origin point pretty accurately. I can measure how high it's gone or it's going, and I can tell you even before the bubble burst, the downside is back to where it started in stocks. For real estate, it's 85% down to that origin point. Commodity, it's 100%. Real estate and commodities take longer than stocks because people can sell stocks much more quickly. But bubbles are really predictable because they follow that orgasm model. And, and so it's not a black swan. And people say that. Economists use that as an excuse because they don't understand the economy and they definitely don't understand bubbles because they've never had an orgasm. <laughs> right. Now, now, the most important focus of your book is right in the title, The Sale of a Lifetime. What buying opportunities do you see in financial assets and what opportunities do you see to buy in this sale? Well, you know, first of all, in when a bubble, in a debt bubble, and a financial asset bubble burst, like in the early 30s and many times throughout history, almost everything goes down. It's a reset in all financial asset prices because bubble, bubbles, debt bubbles cause them to go to elevated levels. So there is no asset allocation strategy or a safe place to hide, except for in cash or very highest quality bonds, or in this case, as in 2008, the safe haven ended up not being gold, as all the gold bugs said. It was the U.S. dollar went up 27%, while gold went down 33%, and silver went down 50%, and everything else, real estate, commodity, stocks around the world crashed. So, but here's the secret, is that you're going to see this reset in asset prices, but it's going to happen quicker for bonds, and then quicker for stocks than real estate, and commodities have already seen probably 80% of their ultimate crash, so they may bottom early. So what we're going to be looking for, and we look at in the book, here are the sectors that are most likely to bottom first, but we're going to see a three-year period where the crash ominous, like 29 to 32, and then we're going to see a, a, a two- to three-year period of aftershocks. Um, and so there's going to be three to six years where you can buy stuff at cheapest price you'll ever see the rest of your lifetime. Imagine what couldn't you bought in late 32 for things like stocks and in early 33 for real estate and commodities and everything else. In that short time period, what couldn't you you bought and not made money on forever? Never seen those prices again. It's a once-in-a-lifetime sale. It becomes once every two generations, currently 80 years, like the 30s and now. And, and people are not going to see it. But the problem is, if you don't get out of this bubble and protect the gains you made, which you don't deserve, by the way, in real estate and stocks and everything else, if you don't turn that into cash or safe assets, you're not going to have the resources to buy stuff at the lowest prices you or your kids will ever, ever see. So, so that's the trick. That what I'm trying to get people to say: Look, this is not. Yeah, stocks over, but this is not an ordinary correction cycle or, or whatever. This is the greatest bubble in modern history. China is the greatest bubble of all the bubbles, and it's going to go down the hardest. And everybody's saying they're going to have soft landing. Not a chance in hell. Not going to happen. You need to get serious, get safe now. And hey, what are you going to miss? The last two years, stocks are up a couple percent, and only in the U.S. in the large caps, not in small caps. Not in Europe, not in China, not in um, Japan. You're going to hang, hang out for another couple percent, maybe, and then suddenly stocks could be down 40 percent before you know it and down 80 percent three, four, five years from now. So we're saying you got to get serious, protect yourself. If we don't see this bubble start to burst the next year, then you can say, you know, Harry's full, you know. But I'm telling you, get safe now. You got little upside and you got extreme downside and again extreme this is once in a lifetime 
every generation, every 40 years, we get a major long-term 12 to 14-year downturn in stocks that were like 40, 50, 60 percent. But once in a lifetime, every other generation, we get a downturn in stocks that's more like 70, 80, 90 percent. And the Great Depression crash was 89 percent for large cap cow stocks. How do you like them apples? Are you going to sit through that? Are you going to love your stockbroker who said, oh, that's all right, we got you diversified, and stocks always go up, and Warren Buffett's saying you can't go wrong buying blue chip uh, West companies. Warren Buffett should shut up and keep buying stocks, and he's going to lose a lot of money. He's not going to look so good three years from now, but he is a real good stock picker. He does have a discipline. doesn't mean he understands the economy. He certainly doesn't understand bubbles or cycles. He would not be telling the U.S. public that this is okay. It's not okay. Yeah, I just saw that Berkshire Hathaway has had the largest cash position it's had. So maybe Warren Buffett is seeing what you're seeing, but is telling the public something different for political reasons. Yeah, well, I think any smart person can start to see it. But again, I think what happened was in the last crisis, he came in and helped out the U.S. government. And the U.S. government gave him some very favorable deals, and he suddenly became a cheerleader for the recovery and for the government policies of endlessly printing money. And he's saying it's okay. Right. It's not okay to try to get to try to add debt and new money to an already overinflated debt bubble. How the solution to a debt bubble? The 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 world has added fifty seven trillion dollars in debt globally to the fifty five trillion it added in the last bubble in this recovery. We've we've added more debt than ever. How could you how can you solve a debt crisis with more debt? A 10-year-old could understand this. A 4-year-old could understand it, I think. Economists can't understand it. I agree. It's crazy. So what do you think are some of the scenarios that could trigger this bubble to pop? Like, for instance, maybe a Deutsche Bank with its massive derivatives exposure. There, there are three big things for me, three triggers. The most impending trigger is Deutsche Bank and Italy. Deutsche Bank is going down like a stuka, okay? And Italy has 18% non-performing loans in their banking system, and there's no way that, that, that Merkel or the uh, Eurozone is going to bail them out. Uh, they didn't bail out Cyprus. They required bail-ins. And Merkel's even saying we can't really bail out Deutsche Bank because we're telling all the other banks in Europe we can't bail them out. We'd be hypocrites. So, so Deutsche Bank's flaming down. Bank stocks, global banks um, around the world are still losing money on bad loans. Deutsche Bank's just one of the worst, and the Italian banks, the leading ones, are even worse than that. I think this is the first trigger, and, and, it's, and it's a strong trigger. Second trigger, which has started but is not as strong, is the fracking industry in the United States was a bubble industry from day one. It started after the great crash, 2008. Cheap junk bonds pushed down by, by central bank easing and, and quantitative easing. These people were borrowing at 5 to 6% for high-risk drilling instead of 8 to 10%. You know what that does for your profitability? And on top of that, the goosing of the global economy caused oil prices to bounce from 32 bucks, and we predicted that downturn, and we still say there's more coming, to 115 now it's back down. It's been down to 26 it's bounced up to 50-something, now it's at 40-something. Oil's going to go to somewhere between 8 to $20 before this is over. The frackers can't make it at that. They're all going to default. That's a trillion-dollar industry that's going to default all over the place, and they've already started. That's a smaller trigger, a big trigger by far. And I've told people I will quit my profession in three to four years if we do not see China go down, and it'll be the biggest bubble burst in history because their real estate – our real estate went up 2.3 times and then crashed after six years. Since 2000, Shanghai real estate's gone up nine times. Wow. Nine. Shenzhen's gone up more than that. Article this week, they're selling apartments now in Shenzhen, the highest price city in China that's grown the most in price in the last year, a 66-square-foot closet apartment with a fold-down bed, a small toilet, and a sink and microwave or something for $132,000 in U.S. $132,000 for a closet. How do you like them apples? <laughs> wow. Now what Is that a bubble? Does that <laughs> quack like a bubble? 
<laughs> yeah. yeah, no, that, that, that's crazy. What, what uh, do you think will be the best country to invest in in the coming years ahead? Okay, unquestionably, unless there's political havoc, India. India is the next China. They have not urban. India has underinvested in everything, urbanized slowly. China has overinvested and urbanized too quickly. They've overbuilt their economy 10 to 15 years out. And by the time they recover from this overbuilding and crisis and real estate crash, their demographics are going to be as bad as Japan's. India has demographics that goes up into the 2060s, as does most of the rest of the emerging world, anywhere from 2040s to 2100 plus. In Africa, the emerging world is going to be the next great boom. And with it, commodities are going to grow like crazy, including gold, because emerging countries spend much higher percentage of their lower incomes on commodities. And emerging countries, which I proved in the demographic clip, will never be as rich as the United States. Only the tiger countries, Japan, South Korea, countries like that, Singapore, actually move from emerging to first world countries over a matter of decades. All the rest of the emerging countries are just plotting, moving up from two to 5,000 GDP per capita to 10 to 15. They will never be as rich as us, including China. China's on that same path. China is not accelerating in their wealth, except for the wealthiest people, like Japan and South Korea and Taiwan. They're not, and they will not, and they're getting ready to burst. So India is my number one pick um, for countries. And then Southeast Asia. Uh, that's the best part of the world. The whole emerging world is going to do well, but Latin America is already fully urbanized uh, and will only benefit more from commodity prices going up. I would bet on India first. India would probably be the first country we would recommend to buy. In, in other words, on the first round of stock crashes, I might say, hey, you can start to buy India now, even though I might say you got to wait a couple of years to buy the U.S. again. The next big demographic group after the baby boomers are the millennials. What are some of the changes that you see between the generational cycles of the boomers and the millennials? And how does this impact your models to predict future economic cycles? Well, first of all, I could talk an hour about that, but I'll I'll try to make it short. (laughs) Um, The millennials have more people because the birth trends lasted longer than the baby boom and they started from much higher levels but the millennial birth levels even when i adjust for immigration never got quite as high got almost to where the baby boom was in other words for the first time in history we're going to have a generation follow the previous one and not take everything to new heights we're not going to need more homes than we already had or more car production and, and the economy and the stock market may, may not get in the decades ahead any higher than it got at the top of this boom We've never seen that before. The baby boom was massively larger than the Bob Hope generation. So that's a big deal. And and no industry is more affected than that in real estate because real estate lasts forever. And and for years, I was pulling my hair out because, you know, we take any sector of the economy, cars, real estate, anything, potato chips, whatever not, and move it forward from people peaking the spending. We have statistics that tag this just like life expectancy. I was like, why didn't Japan's real estate, which collapsed 67%, by the way, people think real estate can't go down that much. It did in Japan already. Never bounced when the millennial generation there came along uh, in, in, in the late 90s forward. They were in a house buying cycle. The reason I finally figured out, other than bad economy and new generation that's more cautious and has seen real estate gone down and doesn't even want to get married and have sex because they can't afford to, it was because the old, the baby boom generation were starting to die. Dyers are sellers in real estate. Right. Since real estate lasts forever. That's what makes real estate unique versus clothes or food, or even cars and stuff that we buy. It lasts forever. Japan has 8 million, out, I don't know, 70 million households, 60 million houses, 8 million vacant homes. China has 27% of its condos and homes vacant in major cities. First, because they're overbuilding, but second, because they're starting to age. But Japan, just on aging, has 8 million vacant homes because old people die. Okay, here's a house available. There's not enough young people to move into them, so they just sit there. In Germany, they've been covering over office parks and residential developments for years to hide demographic decline. You know what the next big country to fall off the demographic cliff faster than Japan did in the 90s? Germany. 
and the rest of Southern Europe and Austria, and everybody thinks Germany's going to hold up the European Union, they're going to go down faster than anybody when it comes down to it. And Deutsche Bank just got listed as the riskiest bank in the world. They have 2.68% capital to cover losses against their assets, the lowest of any major bank in the world. And they've gone from $200 billion market cap down to $16 billion. And they just got that Department of Justice judgment for $14 billion. They are dead. Wow. The biggest bank in Germany and Commerce Bank, the second biggest bank's right behind them. And most of the banks in Italy are already bankrupt. They just haven't announced funeral yet. I just, think, I just saw there was a ton of layoffs, too, at Commerce Bank about the, like yeah, the same thing. 9,000. Like, yeah. I don't know, 20% of their staff or something in their headquarters? Yeah. The markets on crap just go, oh, well, that just means more central bank, you know, easing and, and, and quantitative easing and negative interest rates. But it, the markets have gotten so stoned on this high and all this government support and backdrop that they just think the markets can't go down. That's when they go down, when can, people are convinced. Every bubble history has crashed, like 1929, when the major economists back then, Irving Fisher or somebody came and said, we're in a plateau of prosperity. He said that in 1929. That's when the market went down. Right. He's basically saying the market can't go down because of X. I don't care what causes the bubble. Many things cause bubbles, supply limitations, uh, environmental disasters, uh, OPEC cartels, or demand bubbles like the baby boom, especially in certain major cities with limited supply. I don't care what causes bubbles. Bubbles defeat themselves every time, and when they finally get to that grain of sand, that drops on a mound and cause an avalanche, it is an avalanche. It doesn't go down any other way. It does not have a soft landing. Now, Mr. Dent, a core message in our show is to leave our families, communities, and the world better than we found it by passing down a mindset, values, and principles to future generations, not just money. If you cannot pass on any money to future generations and we're only allowed to pass on three principles to them, to build wealth and achieve happiness and success, what would they be? Well, you know, it, it's technologies change and how we live change and where we live and what we can do. Nobody could have imagined us flying around the world in a matter of hours, you know, just a, two generations ago or all this stuff. Things like that change, but certain things stay the same. Hard work, investment, saving an investment and investing systematically in the future um, are what create wealth and progress and innovation. And, and young people drive innovation, and then older people, as they earn and spend money, adopt those innovations. So innovation is also predictable. If you want to see the future, look at what the 1% to 10% are doing now in any market, because they're the future, because the 10 to 90% will follow them. If you want to see where the economy is going, look at the demographic trends of when the maximum amount of people are going to spend the most money. So the economy is not so unpredictable. Short term is still hard to predict, especially in a, in a market like this that's in artificial manipulation. Long term trends, you can see if you just look at the basics and you can invest in those long term trends and you can work hard. That's how you build wealth. You don't build wealth flipping stocks or real estate, especially in novel. Well, Mr. Dan, can my audience learn more about you, your company, all of your books, and keep informed of all of the projects that you're involved with? I mean, again, I mean, saleofalifetime.com is where you can get our book. We, we're offering it exclusively through Amazon in the early um, launch here. And uh, you go to harrydent.com. We've got a free daily newsletter where you can learn more about us and how we think. And then we've got other newsletters and services after that. But we say, hey, look, listen to us until you fall in love with us or not. That's our marketing strategy. Mr. Dent, thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing your knowledge and insights on these bubbles that you have identified, what could trigger these bubbles to pop, and sharing strategies to protect your wealth when these bubbles pop, and how we can profit from the sale of a lifetime. Thank you so much for providing so much value for my listeners. If you want to be prepared for the sale of a lifetime, you can grab a copy of Mr. Den's book, A Sale of a Lifetime, on Amazon.com. Thank you for joining Harry Dent and myself on the Cashflow Ninja podcast today. 
If you like what you hear and appreciate what we're trying to build here at Cashflow Ninja, please subscribe, rate, and review our show on iTunes and share our show with friends, family, and your network. I've been really humbled by your support and feedback. So if there's any way that I can provide more value to you and serve you better, please reach out to me at info at cashflowninja.com. Your emails and questions and suggestions have been awesome. And I learned so much from those feedback, suggestions, and comments from you guys. Don't forget to take advantage of the offers from our partners that aims to empower you to be healthy, wealthy, and wise. Our healthy partner, Onnit, provides supplements, nutrient-dense, and earth-grown foods, and fitness equipment to achieve your next level of well-being and total human optimization. Our listeners can get a 10% discount with coupon code GETONIT at Cashflow Ninja Health. Com. Our wealthy partner, Fundrise, gives everyone the opportunity to invest directly in high-quality real estate without the middleman. Fundrise makes the process of investing in the highest-quality commercial real estate from around the country simple, efficient, and transparent. You can get started with as little as $1,000 and don't have to be an accredited investor to participate in some of their offerings. You can check them out at CashflowNinjaWealth.com. And our wise partner, Audible, offers a free download of any audiobook when you try Audible for 30 days. You can download your free audiobook at CashflowNinja.com. If you enjoyed the interview today, I highly recommend downloading The Demographic Cliff. It's a very, very interesting book, and I learned a lot about cycles, bubbles, and especially demographics. As I've mentioned in previous podcasts, the baby boomer trend will be the biggest one of our lifetime and is definitely one that I'm keeping a close eye on. So I would highly recommend the book, The Demographic Cliff from Harry Dent. You can get that and download that for free at CashflowNinjaBook.com. That's our show for today, everyone. Until next time, live a life of passion and purpose on your terms. You have been listening to The Cashflow Ninja with your host, MC Laubscher the podcast empowering and inspiring people to discover how to generate their own income and manage, grow, and protect their own wealth in the new economy. Today's show notes and resources are available on our website, CashflowNinja.com. This presentation is for educational and informational purposes only. The information being presented and considered does not consider your particular financial objectives or situation, and it does not make personalized recommendations. This material is not intended to replace the advice of a qualified tax and legal advisor or other qualified professionals, and you should not use the information in place of a customized consultation with a licensed professional regarding your specific personal financial objective, situation, and needs. We believe the information provided is reliable, but we do not guarantee its accuracy, timeliness, or completeness. 